Hello, my name is John Mad Dog Hall, and I'm the Executive Director of Linux International. I'm also a computer engineer who has been in the computer industry since 1969. I was asked to come to For Linux to talk about the issues of privacy that is going on today, how people can be secure in their communications, and you know my opinions of what is going on. First of all, I would like to define some terms. There is commercial privacy versus governmental privacy. Commercial privacy is what is a contract between you and a particular company as to what they can do with the data which you are giving to them. So as an example of this, Google is very forthright by saying, if you type in things, we are going to scan it, we're going to do statistical analysis on it, we're going to keep your data for a certain period of time, and then we're going to deposit it and get rid of it. These are the things that you see in the contract of Google on their website. And as long as they stay to that, then you have the right to either use their functionality or not use their functionality. The government has other requirements. And it depends on the government that you're in, the country that you're in, how the government can treat your data. There are some governments that everything belongs to them. And consequently, you really don't have any privacy or protection. There's other governments who say that there are certain laws that give you, guarantee you, a certain amount of privacy. And if the courts determine that they need to be searched, then they will do that. So the question here is, what do you uh, know, what can you decide upon? Are you being told the entire truth about what's happening so that you can make a decision about whether or not you want to share your data? Now, in the United States, I'm going to talk about the United States because that is my country, that we have a constitution, and a constitution is looked at as being the supreme law of the land. And in that constitution, there was a guarantee that you would not be able to be searched or have your house searched or be detained for any reasonable period or unreasonable period of time unless you had due cause, which means that there was enough evidence against you that somebody would go to a judge and the judge would say, okay, I'm going to order this person held or I'm going to give a search warrant or something like that. That was the Patriot Act, however, ended all of that because it declared terrorism a war. And then we went into the Articles of War, which can take away certain of these rights for a certain period of time. Whether or not you agree with that, that is the case. And under the Patriot Act, these laws were changed dramatically into the, into the point where the steps necessary to be able to search people's houses, to be able to search their data, were reduced dramatically and greater strength was given to a lot of agencies to be able to sift through data, to look at data, if they suspected that a terrorist activity was going to be happening. However, I want people to realize and remember that for a long time we have never really been private. If you have credit cards, that the credit card companies can take that data they know what you bought, where you bought it, they know what time you bought it, and they, they know everything about the purchase. They can literally trace you as you go using your credit card from place to place. This is why a lot of people only pay cash for a lot of things, because they don't want to have that trace put on them. Uh, private investigators going out and being hired by somebody to follow somebody else or to investigate something else. Of course, they can't go in and search your house without the same type of search warrant, but they're invading your privacy in a lot of cases. Today, with the internet, we're probably less safe than ever in a lot of different ways. The internet can be used as a tool which gives, trades information and makes life better. On the other hand, it can be used as a, a means of communication for, you know, uh, invading countries or terrorist attacks or things like that. 
Now, a lot of the internet is controlled by the United States. Some of the agencies that are involved with giving names and numbers and setting up routers and things like that are under United States control and they are United States uh, organizations. A lot of the companies that people use, Google, Facebook, uh, eBay, uh, a lot of them are based in the United States. A lot of the software companies like Microsoft, Red Hat Software, you know, a lot of other different uh, companies are United States based. And even though Red Hat is free and open source software, if you go to their site, they will tell you that they cannot sell services in certain countries such as Cuba, Iran, because these countries are looked at as being enemies of the United States. And so you can see that even with free and open source software, there are certain things that people can't do because they are United States companies. Likewise, there's a certain amount of outsourcing that's being done. So even though you think you're using a service that's in your country, it could actually be uh, produced some other place and under the laws of that country. So if, you're out, if your support line is in India or if your support line is in uh, China, then the people there are under Chinese law and Indian law. And the amount of information you give to them, the programs you're using and things like that, can be taken by the Chinese and Indian government. There are embargoes that come about from different countries. I mentioned Cuba before. The United States has had an embargo against Cuba for over 40 years. And if you are a country that is using software, you have to give thought to whether or not you can support yourself with your software needs if some other country was to create an embargo against you. Let's talk a little bit, and I'm not blaming these countries, believe, these companies, believe me, this is not a blame game, okay, blame game, okay. Microsoft and Oracle, I'm going to use those as an example. They are both loyal U.S. companies. They are, you know, the main bulk of their corporate staff lives in the United States, and they are loyal U.S. citizens. And they create these things called binary blobs. Binary programs, you can't see the source code. And even they have programs where you supposedly can look at the source code that they have in their source code pools under certain contract. But the problem is that that code isn't necessarily the code that built your product. There's no guarantee that the code you're looking at is actually the code that built the binary object you have. And if people doubt that Trojan horses and other types of things can be put into software, then I point at the very famous Iran centrifuges, which just fell apart because of some mysterious little uh, virus, and the very accurate missiles that were happening during the Iraq war, which may have gotten their information for guidance into the target from binary software that's in, that was being used. And the, the uh, injunctions of the United States against companies like ZTE and Huawei, who are telecommu Chinese telecommunications companies, that the United States government is saying, we're not going to buy hardware from these companies because we're afraid that this hardware is going to be spying upon our communications. And these companies, China comes back and says, hey, we're not going to buy any telecommunications uh, so hardware and software from the United States because we're afraid that the United States is going to spy on us. And hey, gang, you were doing this first. So again, I'm, you know, I'm kind of neutral to all this, but I'm trying to explain that this has been going on a long time and that these companies who are loyal to their company and under the laws of their country are reacting to that. Um, part of what's disturbed me for a long time is what I call cloud mania, where people are taking more and more of the computer systems that are under their control and moving it to the cloud. Well, the thing is, if that cloud is not over your country, if that cloud is in another country, then you really need to think about where that cloud is and under what laws that a cloud exists. Because it could well be 
that some other country generates a subpoena from a court and goes in and takes your data to see whether or not you are a terrorist. Uh, recently, of course, in the news has been Snowden, who has uh, uh, shown a lot of the things that the NSA has been doing. And the, I think at this point it is fairly well known that the NSA was more or less overstepping, and I'm, I'm being kind here, more or less overstepping the rights they had and the duties they had in gathering data for United States citizens. Now, I don't know how horrible the terrorist attacks are out there. I don't know how many terrorist attacks there are. I don't know how many terrorist attacks they intercepted because of the work they did. But there always has to be the question of whether or not you're going to give away your freedoms because you're afraid of terrorists. As a lot of people point out, you know, there's more people every day killed in automobile accidents in the United States than have been killed in all of the combined terrorist attacks throughout history. So, you know, what do you give up when this type of thing happens? Now, I've been in the business for a very long time. And I remember very well back in 1986, we were shipping out our first Unix product from Digital Equipment Corporation called Ultrix. And when we started to manufacture it, we sent it to our export department. And the export department asked those famous words, Does this have any encryption software in it? And we said, yes, yes it does. The, the method of protecting passwords uses encryption. Uh, but it's only a one-way encryption. You, you can't de-encrypt it even if you know the password, you know, the, the, the password. You, you can't. And, and the thing that's encrypted is always the same. So what's happening is you encrypt the password and it compares the encrypted passwords and if they match, then you're okay. Well, that wasn't good enough. And so we had to create a special export package for this. And later on, and this kept going, the, the, the laws were so strange and so perverse that if we purchased some encryption software from Canada, brought it in as shrink-wrapped, and then turned around and sold the same shrink-wrapped package back to Canada, we couldn't do that. And after a period of time, we realized that we were losing our best cryptologists to Canada because up there they could go into the business of creating these packages and you know for the most part all of our enemies already knew how to do all this encryption anyway. So uh, Bill Clinton dropped these laws and said this is kind of crazy we're losing business and stuff so we're going to drop this requirement. Now after September the 11th 2001 there was, you know, people found out that yes, a few encrypted messages were sent by some of the terrorists and some of our senators decided to put this law back in place. And I had to write a four-page letter to one of them stating how encryption was the basis of authentication and that if we block encryption and don't share it with at least our allies, then they will not be able to authenticate that messages were coming from us. And I can't sit here and say that my letter changed the course of that history, but the, the congressman never put his bill into place. So this brings us down to something that happened to me recently. On the bottom of my business card, I have my PGP key. PGP is pretty good privacy. It was started by a guy named Phil Zimmerman. And Mr. Zimmerman was prosecuted by our government for a long period of time because they considered him uh, shipping his algorithm around to be munitions, like bullets. Finally, this case was dropped and people could use encryption to, for privacy and for authentication. Now, I've been, like I said, I've had this on the bottom of my business card for a long time. I handed this business card to a very young programmer, a geek, and he looked at that and said, what is that? And that to me is disturbing. I mean, I don't care 
that he doesn't use it himself. I don't care that, you know, whether he uses it or not. But the fact he didn't even know what it was is disturbing to me. And I think that more computer science people should study encryption, uh, protection, security, and things like that, because we are coming into a situation where you never know where your data is going to go. And so I encourage other people to understand what encryption is and to understand some of the areas of, of privacy and to be able to use things like PGP and the GNU version of that was GPG. Create your, your web of trust, create the trust between the people that you know and encrypt the data which you want to keep private and to make sure your mail readers are able to use that easily so that you, you get into the, the habit of using it. There are other types of things you can do. For example, create, having your own name server to make sure that the names inside your name server are the ones you want to use. There's all sorts of things here. The internet is inherently not secure. I've been working on a number of projects over the years uh, one project, for instance, was a project called OpenMoco. It was to create a completely open phone, open hardware and open software. The open software would allow you to change the software to put any operating system you wanted on it. And we actually had Debian, and we had a version of Android, and we had a series of other operating systems. But the other thing was the open hardware. Because a lot of times in current hardware, whether it be a phone or a desktop, even though you may be running Linux, free software on it, the BIOS is closed and proprietary. Or you have a video driver that's closed and proprietary. And any one of these could have a binary blob in it, which is a Trojan horse, which is actually communicating information back to some entity. I'm not saying that that is the case, but I am saying it's a possibility. And unless you can build your entire operating system and your BIOS and your, and your video from source code that you have inspected, you have no way of proving that this is not happening. There's also the issue of your carriers, your telephone companies. They too are under the laws of your country or some other's country. And you know, phones that use GSM typically have binary blobs in them to control the phone, to control the modem, and they use encryption to encrypt the messages, but these, this encryption is weak. It's easily broken. So all of these are things that could create the ability of somebody else to intercept your data and to be able to use it. So what we really need are completely open systems. Open systems where you know every single piece of them is inspectable. Not that you would do it, but the fact, the very fact that it could be done would deter a lot of people from doing it. So once again, my name is John Mad Dog Call. My message to you now is that is it possible for people to intercept what we do on the internet and listen to us? Yes. Is it something which can be easily fixed? Not really. And should we start to fix it? Yes. Even though it will take a long time, we need to start. We need to be able to say that we can make our communications private and we can go back and force people to have the rule of law which says if you suspect us, then you can search via a court order, but you can't just go in and look at what we're doing. Thank you very much.